I understand you've had some great speakers this week. You've had Tom Bauer, I've, I've heard. You've had Gerard Tubb as well from Sky. I used to work with Gerard there a few years ago. Um, my intention here today, I've got probably like 40, half an hour, 40 minutes. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about myself and about what I've done and my career up to now. But I guess mainly what I think or what I want to try and do is devote a bit of time to a Q&A because really it's more about what you can gain from, from me coming to speak to you and, and being here today. And I don't want to be as presumptuous to, to, to learn or, or to think I know what it is that you want to hear. So, um, so let me kick things off and I'll tell you a little bit about my background and what I've done and, and where I'm at now. So um, I am currently at the BBC, but I started my career in journalism when I was at ITV. I was on a program called uh, Jonathan Dimbleby on a Sunday morning. Um, before that, uh, I, was, I worked for an MP and I uh, did a master's as well, but I, have, I didn't do a, any journalism training. I didn't go to journalism school and I don't, don't have any formal training. So you're already one step ahead uh, of me on this one. And I think it's probably very wise what you're doing because the reasons for that, and we'll come on to that, I guess, in time, is that I think the skills that you're learning now and the things that you're developing now are going to be standing in good stead for when you do go out into the world of work and when you start talking to employers. So um, I was at Jonathan Dimbleby, I was a researcher there for about a year, and then I became a producer, and we did sort of political guests on a Sunday morning. Uh, and then from there, I went to Sky News, and I was at Sky News for six years, um, mainly producing the, uh, the Sunrise program uh, with Eamon Holmes in the morning, um, booking guests, getting stories ready, talking to correspondents, talking to reporters, talking to editors, and getting the show ready. And then, uh, in about 2009, I became a producer uh, to the sports correspondent, Ian, a guy called Ian Dobberson, and I started specializing in sports news. Um, two years on from that, 2011, uh, I went to BBC, started as a reporter, uh, now a correspondent there for sports news, working mainly for Five Live, Radio 4, um, and in the TV as well. So um, my work sort of takes me across all the different areas of sports news. It's, it's not sport itself, but it's the news of sports, so the politics, the business, uh, the finance of sport, um, and it's a real specialism within the sports department. And as you can probably know over the last few years, it's been quite a busy period for sports news, what with the IAAF and with FIFA, uh, and with all other things in the Olympics and the post-Olympic legacy and everything else. So there's been quite a busy time to be in that job. Um, so that's kind of bringing you up to date with where I am. Um, I kind of think, you know, I don't, the, the, I think the message I would probably want to get across today is to do all you can now to prepare yourself for what you're going into. And I know you've probably heard that from lots of people this week and from your lecturers and from, from the other guests, but I can't really under, under, like, sort of over, sort of overestimate it enough because you're going out into a, a, a marketplace now, a job market, which is, I don't think it's ever been uh, as competitive, I don't think it's ever been as busy. You're up against um, so, you know, the, the whole growth of online news now and, uh, you know, journalism in terms of just people taking on stories and doing it and, and, and the need for good journalism, for quality journalism has never been as high, but yet people's belief in journalism, it seems from the public, is, is perhaps never been as low um, or it certainly feels that way from, from what's happening over recent weeks and months. So the need for quality journalism, I don't think has ever been as apparent. So what you're doing here now is really good preparation for going out there. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point because I want to know what you want to know and I want to steer the conversation in, in the direction that you want to go. So I'll, who wants to go first? Anyone got a question? Um, you work on Asian football. Yeah. So I want to ask you if you think in our country there's bias against like the Chinese football revolution. Yeah. Um, do you think there's more scope, more coverage of Asian football anywhere? Okay, so the background to, to that question. Um, sorry, what's your name? Peter, so Peter, the background, I think, that question is that you may have seen what I did earlier this year in China. Is that, okay, so earlier this year, I went to China um, to talk about and did a documentary about the rise of Chinese football, the Chinese Super League, and the growth in um, uh, the interest in sport in China. And that all stems really from the Chinese president who has decided that he wants China to be uh, a football superpower by 2050. And he wants China to have a sports industry um, that rivals the US uh, as well in that time, which is a huge task when you think about creating that. When you think about what the, the, the development of the sports market uh, in the US in terms of all the different sports and the infrastructure and stadiums and fans, 
that they've got there uh, and what China have now, which is, which is not a great deal. They've got a super league. Um, they've got great interest in sport, but it's not really that, that, that much there. So the documentary looked into all those different things. Um, they did a piece for the 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock news as well. Um, but I think you're right in terms of the, there's, I think there is possibly um, a prejudice against a, a Asian sport. It, it's certainly not just in, in UK, but in, in Europe. Maybe prejudice is the wrong word, but there's certainly a, res, a reluctance to acknowledge what's happening over there. Um, I think some people see Chinese football as something, maybe a, um, a retirement home for footballers, that, it's, that they're going there just to, to take up the money. But when you go there and you see what's happening, and you get on the ground, then I think that's, I think that's a big um, eye-opener for what they want to do. And I think that's, a, again, that's a lesson for, for, for lots. I think I've seen some journalism, uh, some reports, uh, which have gone down that line and have sort of said, oh, it's just, you know, it'll, it's a flash in the pan. It's, it's happened here before. But until you get out there, until you see what's happening, um, I don't think you can you really get a true idea of it. So I think, um, I think there'll be a big market in Europe, I think, certainly, for, for, that, for more accurate reporting about what's happening in Asian sport and certainly within Chinese football. Um, and I think it's, it's a really the start of that growth market, really. Um, that's a big one, yeah. Um, I mean, maybe that's probably a good opportunity to talk a little bit about what I've done with FIFA and just explain about that as well. So um, one of my sort of specialisms is, is FIFA and, and looking at what happened, uh, what's happened there. Um, and I think that's a big lesson I can tell you all as well. Specialism in journalism right now is a really, it, it always has been a big thing, but I think it's becoming more important. And I think employers are certainly looking for that a lot more these days about how you can like really specialize in it. Because there's lots of people who know um, a lot about a little, but if you can show that you know you've got real, uh, real solid knowledge, real solid experience, you really know what's going on in your chosen area, and whether that can that can be across the board, whether it's economics, business, sport, finance, whatever it is, then I think that that really shows. So FIFA was certainly an area that I sort of targeted from about 2009 onwards, and the reason was is because it was an absolute basket case. You could see. Uh, Oh, I certainly thought I could see where it was going because there was lots of these big egos, lots of money, um, a governance structure that was just uh, chaotic um, and which in the end, if you look at it from a, from a journalistic point of view, you thought there's going to be stories here, there's going to be potential here, and there's going to be lots of different strands that you can pull at. And again, I think that's another thing, and in, in, I'm talking about sport and FIFA here, but I think that applies across the board. If you can find an area in your work, or you can find um, a subject or, or a niche subject that's got lots of different spin-offs, that's going to take you, that's got issues, that's going to sustain you over a period of time, then that's worth a lot. That's got, that's got big currency for you and for, and for an employer, especially if you're freelance or if you're working for, for you know, a dedicated broadcaster or a paper. You know, so FIFA was, was, was that, was sort of that for me. I could see it had lots of different things, whether it be goal line technology which came in a few years ago, whether it be individual spats over players or what's been you know, sustaining me for the last couple of weeks, which is this row over, over poppies and where poppies on armbands, England and Scotland having that row. Issue-based journalism will get you a long way. So when it came to 2015, uh, and the whole thing spectacularly fell apart in May and June of 2015 with the FBI making dawn raids uh, at, at the hotel. Um, I was in Zurich that day. I got a tip off the night before that that was going to happen. Um, and managed to be at the hotel by 6 a.m. that morning and reporting live from within, from within the hotel. So that was a good, it was a crazy week. Didn't get much sleep that week, by the next three weeks. Um, but it was, it was a good lesson in, in another thing as well, which is in, in contacts, and keeping your contacts and knowing your contacts and having them in a position whereby when stuff is going to happen in your sphere, in your story, in your area, that they're going to call you and let you know. So. FIFA since then, to, answer, to come back to your question, FIFA since then has kicked on, they've developed, there's a new president in place, there's a new governance structure in place, um, they're not out of the woods yet, I think there's a lot of things that they still need to, have to, to get a grip on, but they have steadied the ship, they have calmed things down quite a lot. Um, from my point of view, that's obviously, uh, <laughs> it's good and bad news in some ways, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's certainly not as, as, uh, as, as volatile as it has been. Um, but that in itself leads on to, to other areas, you know, and you can, you can monitor that and you can be that, try and be that check and balance on what's happening. So it's, it's, worth, uh, it's worth keeping an eye on, certainly. I think there's, there's going to be a lot more to it. But for the time being, 
that seem to have calmed down. But there's other areas as well. So the, you know, video technology is a, a big one with people at the moment. And the poppy story as well, yeah. Well, I, well, I'll tell you what I think about that. I'm really annoyed, not with, this, not with the poppies issue, but I'm annoyed with myself at the moment. And, and the reason being, one of the things that I did this morning was um, uh, after work last night, finished work by 7 o'clock, and went to the pub with a couple of uh, people from, from work. Uh, I was having a pint and looked up at my phone and saw that story had dropped that FIFA had charged England and Scotland for wearing the armband with the poppy on during their game at Wembley uh, the other week. Now, that's a breach of Law 4 of FIFA's code, which says you can't have any political or religious symbols um, on any of the players' clothing. Now, England and Scotland said they're going to fight this. They say it's a misinterpretation of the rules. Big row. Rows are great. Rows always give you good, good, good stories. They always give you good copy, always get interest, and it's been, it's been a good story for the past couple of weeks. But having this pint with my mates last night, looked at the phone, saw it, thought, all right, they've been charged. I was expecting that to happen. Thought that was going to happen. Knew it was going to happen. It's fine. Called the desk um, at the BBC. They were happy with it. Made a call to the FA on the, on the bus on the way home. Uh, everything all right? You know, you're going to fight this? Yeah, yeah, off record. We're going to fight this. We're still going to do it. But what happened this morning? Woke up this morning, turned over the back page of the Daily Mirror. There's John Cross from the Daily Mirror with an exclusive saying that not only are they going to look at FIFA looking at the armband, but they're also looking at the minute silence before the game. They're looking at uh, the playing of the last post. They're playing, looking at why there were big poppies on big screens around the stadium. And I missed the story. And the reason I missed the story is because I was in the pub having a pint and not on the phone to FIFA and not on the phone to other people in the FA and not on the phone to the Scottish FA as well, because they're involved in this as well. So the valuable lesson is, is not don't, don't not go have a pint, go have a pint. But if you want to get on in journalism, if you want to, to get the story, and if you want to be at the forefront of what you're doing, there is no let up, there is no stop to the story. The story doesn't care whether you're in the pub having a pint or whether you're asleep or whether you've got something on that weekend or that Saturday. If you want to be at the at the forefront of that story of your field, then you've just got to be prepared to make sacrifices in order to deliver on that. And last night, I pulled my hand up. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. And this morning, I got a rude awakening when I saw the story in the back page of the mirror. Rectified the situation because you can make calls and you can get the story and you can stand it up and you can, you know, see what's happening. And we had it on BBC Sport website by about, I think it's about quarter to nine this morning, half past eight, quarter to nine. By the time we'd, we'd, we'd sort of sorted it out, and I'd, well, I'd sorted it out. And, got to grips with it. But take that lesson. If you want to be if you want to be doing this and if you want to do it seriously, and you all seriously do because you're all paying money to be here and you're all seriously involved in this, if you want to do it, you've got to be prepared to give it your all. And if you're not, then the chances are you're going to be like lots of people in, in journalism. Lots of people, you know, make a good living and do a good job. But if you want to be at the forefront of what you're doing and you want to own that story and you don't want to be following, you want to be leading on the story, then you need to to you know, really get on it and, and, and be passionate about it. And I think that's the biggest lesson I can say about that. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You were interviewing uh, last year in Switzerland. Um, what went into researching the story and unearthing the more information and how it was he the character? Was he, uh, was he ignorant towards the situation? Or because he comes across as if he, he, he just lets it slide. So yeah. Like? Um, okay, so on that, so uh, this was back in July, no, August, August of 2015. And um, after the whole FIFA saga had played out, there was a need for, for Seth Blatter to, to get his message across. He was desperate to stay uh, in power. He wanted to stay the head of FIFA. He'd been in, in the organization for 40 years. He'd been president since 1998. He was not going to go without a fight. So. I think the other thing I'll, I'll probably get across from this is that when you're identifying stories and when you're identifying people you want to talk to, sometimes people won't want to talk to you. People, sometimes people will not have a need to talk to you. They won't care to talk to you. It's not in their interest to talk to you. But if you can identify the times when people will want to talk to you, newsworthy people, people who have got a story, people who will give you something, then that's, that's kind of gold. And Blatter was one of those people. Clearly, he had a need to speak. He needed to, to try and salvage whatever was left of his reputation after the events of, of 2015 of that summer. So the negotiations with him started to start with his team, started talking and said, look, can we do something with him? Can we come out to Zurich and maybe talk to him and, and have an interview? And um, uh, they weren't too keen to begin with. They were sort of, you know, because they were protecting him. 
But what it turned out is that he was desperate to stay on. He did not want to be, to be leaving FIFA under a cloud, and he wanted to try and tell the world all the good things that he'd done. So you can try and sort of le leverage that a little bit. So I went to them and said, right, rather than just do an interview, a straight interview in, um, in his office, which you always see, and you always see Blatter behind the lectern, you know, the, 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 in the suit, in, in FIFA, said, why don't we go down to his home village? So he puts on a charity football tournament every year, and we'll do something in the village with him. We'll see him in that context, relaxed. We'll see, we'll see a little bit of his character. And they loved that idea. They, loved, they really liked that idea, we did that. So we went down there, and it was all a bit bizarre. And he was a very, and by this time, I think Blatter had become, had sort of, was so aloof, was so, was so removed from reality um, that he was just in a different world. He was also under a lot of pressure as well because you've got, you know, you've got the, the Department of Justice breathing down your neck, you've got the Swiss authorities breathing down your neck. He hadn't been charged at this point um, by the Swiss authorities. That happened in September, but he knew it was coming. So he was a very, he was a, I found him very, very strange character. He was a very distant man. He was very difficult to get to know with. And by this time, he also had people around him who were simply telling him what he wanted to hear. So in the interview, it wasn't a, it was a, it was a difficult interview in that if you, in that I had, to, I had to get across the right messaging. I had to try and push him on stuff without being too forceful, without being too harsh to him, but at the same time, so he doesn't clam up. But at the same time, you can't be too soft on him and just say, oh, tell us what you want to hear. Tell us what you want to say. You, you know, so it was a very difficult balance in that from that respect. In the end, he talked himself into several corners, which he was sort of able to exploit. Um, but it was a very interesting experience to, to meet him. And I think you, when, when you meet people in authority and you meet people like that, it's interesting to see uh, their current mindset, I would always say that, just to assess what, the, what situation is. And try and look at it from their perspective in your research. What is it that they want to get across? Why, why are they doing this? Why are they talking to you? Everyone has a reason to talk. Did you go into a lot of this competition in uh, the roles he played with or did you go Yeah, well, at that, at that point, that story hadn't broken yet when I interviewed him. This was at the end of August, and we didn't know about the payment between him and Platini until later in September. So, um, so that didn't come up in the interview. I wish it had. I wish we had known about that because it would have been, it would have been good to go up. But yeah. So, um, but he was, yeah, he was a very, he was a, he was a bizarre cat. He was a bizarre man. He was a bizarre man. Yeah. Um, I'll go. Yeah. One, two, three. So I'm not sure if it's a person known story. Andrew Jennings put a lot of his time in, into FIFA. Yeah. Um, and when the Panorama program came out, obviously it was sanctioned by the BBC. Yes. Um, as a journalist working for the BBC, and I've been to the Congress and that. Um, did you ever feel that officials at FIFA or even Blair himself was, 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 was distant with the BBC? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they've got a. How can I put this? Um, football officials have a very standoffish view with the media. Like there's a, there's, there's, I think it's different in Britain to a certain extent. Like the football association are quite, quite friendly. They're quite, you know, they know the game. They kind of understand it. Um, the, the same traditions of tabloid journalism, which is what sort of preceded that, that panorama thing, sort of alienated a lot of Swiss-based uh, sports politicians to the British media, well, to the media in general, especially the British media. We were all tarred with the same brush, that we were troublesome, meddlesome, that we, that we were liars, um, and that we, were, you know, that we were out to get them. Um, now, I can't speak for everyone, but that's certainly not the case with the BBC. You know, you, you go by your, your values and you what you stand for, which is to give everyone a fair hearing, to be, you know, to be, to be independent, um, to be impartial as much as you can, you know, on, on every story. So um, they were, they, they were a difficult bunch to deal with because they, there's a, they don't trust you. But I think that's changing. There's a new core group within FIFA who are from different parts of the world who kind of understand the need for a bit more transparency, kind of understand as well the essential messages that they've got to get across. And without the media, they can't do that. They can, as much as, you know, this is what you've come, those of you who are interested in sports journalism, we've come up against this time and time again, is that football clubs, institutions, bodies will want to put their people through their own websites, through their own filters. You know, the amount of times you see sort of, you know, such and such a club, you know, Manchester United exclusive, M MUTV exclusive. How is that an exclusive? <laughs> it's your own employee. You've simply taken a camera to the training ground. They are trying to change the face of journalism by controlling the message. And social media as well allows them to do that in, in, in a way that wasn't possible when I was starting out. And now that's what you've got to fight against as well. Because why is it that these players or these administrators are going to come and, are going to talk to you? Why, why would they when they've got their own in-house 
media team who can ask nice questions, who can ask what they want to do, who will edit them the right way, and who will present them you know, exactly how they want to present them. Um, and that's a big challenge to get over. Why should they come and talk to you rather than their in-house team? But one of the things that, that you can sell and one of the things you can tell them about that is that you, know, you want credibility. Uh, or they want credibility, and they want the credibility of getting their message across with an independent and impartial form of media. And people, you know, sometimes this is the, this is the difficult thing that we're living through at the moment is the public, do they notice the difference? Do they know the difference between whether they hear from Josie Mourinho on MUTV or whether he's talking to Sky Sports News? That's, that's the thing. Do the public care? I don't know anymore. That's, that's, and that's one of the challenges I think journalism is facing right now. So I just wanted to know if, if you think there's enough coverage of women's spot and disability spot on the BBC. Um, on the BBC, I think it's changing. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's. I don't think there is enough um, in general. I don't think there's enough on the BBC, but I think that is that is certainly changing. Um, and it's a challenge, isn't it? Because I think we've gone from a level where the, where there was virtually nothing at all to where by now you have got um, you know uh, well, I think we've got the women's European qualifiers on or the uh, World Cup qualifiers were on. Um, not enough disability sport. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's that is a challenge, isn't it? Really, I think to to promote that and to do it uh, to do it justice and not to treat it as an afterthought. And I think, um, but I think it's certainly in in the in, in in a it's in the consciousness now of program editors. I think um, from a news perspective, certainly more aware of that. You know, the Paralympics uh, this year in Rio got as much attention um, as the as the Olympics themselves. Um, but you can't have a let up in that. I think I think you've just got to keep on top of that and make sure that that, it, that it's happening. Um, you tell them they have to play Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, um, so for those who don't know, so, so stay safe standing as an issue. This is the, the use of rail seating. There's new technology of seating that's going to allow uh, Premier League clubs to have standing at games again. It's obviously a very sensitive issue because of what happened at Hillsborough uh, in 1989 um, was it when 96 fans lost their lives. Now, the thing is that the, the Taylor report, which came out after Hillsborough, did not blame standing as a cause, but that sensitivity and that complexity to this debate it definitely, it's definitely still there, yeah. So I think one of the challenges this week in reporting that story was to balance it up because there's a big groundswell of opinion now from fans, uh, certainly from Premier, a lot of Premier League clubs now want this because they've seen how it works in Germany. Um, Celtic now have it as well because they're not subject to the, UK, to the, to the English and Welsh legislation on this um, and they've managed to, to persuade Glasgow City Council to introduce it. Um, so you've got this big groundswell from the fans and from the clubs that want it. At the same time, though, you've got um, you know, a, a group of uh, Hillsborough families who are uh, completely opposed to it and, and say it doesn't matter. You know, we, we know standing wasn't the cause, but anything that goes back to standing, anything that goes back to seeing those kind of, that kind of terracing is a retrograde step. You've got to balance. That's an essential part of balancing that argument. I think we will see it within the Premier League. Premier League have clearly made a decision now that they want to introduce it, that they want it in. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna, it is probably going to happen, I think, within the next two or three years. It's going to need a change in the law, an amendment to the law, so it won't be easy for them. Um, but I think the, the wider point of your question, I think, is, is, is very much that, the importance of, um, of balancing that story up and making sure that you've got a fully rounded view um, of, of what it is. Because, you've, you know, you've got people there who I think are maybe haven't even thought about safe standing hasn't been an issue. Within, within Britain hasn't really entered the consciousness. It's sort of something that happens overseas and because of the laws here, it doesn't happen. So I think people are starting to come and think about this issue for the first time. And when you've got issues that people aren't immediately aware of, I think it's even more important then that you have a good range of views um, in your reporting. God, this is, this is lots, of, lots of yes, no questions here, it's good. Um, so one of the things as a BBC journalist is that I can't really have an opinion. Now let me, I'll have to explain that. I can have a qualified opinion. And what do I mean by a qualified opinion is that if I'm on Five Live or I'm talking to the, on the news channel, um, I, can, I can give an opinion, but it has to be backed up by fact. It has to be backed up by, 
by demonstrable fact of what you've seen. I cannot, I cannot come out and say, I think it's a disgrace that Russia have been allowed to enter athletes into this year's Olympics. That's not my view. I don't know. Um, but you can't, I can't come out and directly say that. Um, so that makes you think around the issues a bit more, and it makes you consider, again, going back to the previous question, makes you consider every view what it is. So I may have an opinion on that. I do have an opinion on that question. Um, but it's important for me in representing it, even, even, on the most, even on the clearest of things, even on things where you think, oh, of course there's a right and wrong answer to this. And, and clearly, it depends what the story is. But you know, for the poppies, for example, the poppy story over the last three weeks, I think there's a rump of opinion that says FIFA's wrong on this and that why on earth can't England and Scotland have a poppy on their sleeve? And you may think that, and I think, I think, that's the, I think if we took a poll, most people in Britain would probably say that. It's a remembrance symbol, it's not a political symbol. But then, you know, I interviewed Fatma Samura, who's FIFA's Secretary General, when she came to, to London. We sort of doorstepped her outside her hotel. And she said, you, that Britain is not the only country that's been affected by war. It's a very powerful statement when you think about it. Britain's not the only country. She said, my own continent, which from, which from Senegal, should, you know, um, has been torn by war. So think about that. Think about what would happen if every country wanted their own symbol to represent their war dead or to represent a political issue or to represent something else. Now, we all have differences of opinion on whether the poppy is a political symbol, but until I heard that, you then start, you then start thinking, yes, there is a very solid and incredible different side of this story, and it's very important to represent that. So for that reason, it's a very long-winded answer to your question. I don't have an opinion on that, but I can have a qualified one. You wrote the well, last question, right? Or after, after, after. Well, Yeah. And is this something that should that probably should happen or do you think a more American world player is this is something that, that will be like happen? Um yeah, that's an again I've still got I've got about ten minutes, so I think we're all right, aren't we? Are we you could have the last question. Yeah. So it's actually fine. Get you to be okay, we can put them on. I'll I'll we'll keep them on waiting time, that's fine. Um it's taken me that long to get here. I'm here now. I want to enjoy. Uh so um so I think that question uh, is, sorry, remind me again, sorry. It was so about LA, that was it, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that story was last week, when the, when, the, when the Trump election was on and when the US election was on, it's like a three-day period where sports just wasn't getting on TV at all, it wasn't getting on the news channel, Radio 4 didn't want it, and rightly so, this is a very big US election going on. Day after day after that, you've got to start thinking your way around the story. You want to get your stories on, you want to get your angle on. What's the angle to sport? Where can we take the story? You know, what does President Trump mean for sport? And that's a way, that was a way into it. LA Olympics, LA, Trump elect, election is very bad news for lots of reasons. It's very bad news for LA, certainly, because the IOC voters who are around the world are looking at this man, going, his views are completely contrary to what we believe the Olympic ideal is. So it's, it's very bad news for him. And I think that's, that's, again, just when you're looking at stories and when you're thinking things, and in, if, you, if you've been if tasked with a certain area, um, don't think a certain story is off limits to you. Never think that you can't, there's, there's always, some stories clearly will be, but some stories you can find your way into them. I mean, the best example I heard this year is, you know, um, so Michelle Obama gave a speech, uh, sorry, uh, Melania Trump gave a speech at the Democratic National Convention, uh, and I don't know, you may have heard it, and it was obviously, you know, large sections of it plagiarized from a Michelle Obama speech. Who broke that story? Did anyone know who broke that story, that it was plagiarized? Yeah, it was broken by an out-of-work journalist sat in a Starbucks in San Diego. Wasn't broken by anybody at the Democratic National Convention. Wasn't broken by anyone connected to the Washington bubble. It was an out of work freelancer sat looking at his phone in Starbucks, looked at it and said, I remember, I remember that speech. That was Michelle, Michelle Obama. He broke that story. So never think a story is off limits to you, or that there isn't an angle way in, into it, or that because you're not connected to it. It's all out there, you know? It's all there. Um, I'll, take, I'll, I'll take one more. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, beg your pardon. Republican, yes, yeah, not Democrat, yes. Facts, you see, facts. <laughs> there you go, I'm being fact checked as we go. We're wrapping it up, okay. Yeah. Sorry it's been so rushed. Sorry, I said I'm going to talk to you as well. So yes, okay, no problem. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you very much. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine, all right. Yeah, no. This is okay. No, no, don't at all. I'll